presents Storm Ready 2020, preparing during a pandemic. Sponsored by Greer's Markets. Hi everyone, I'm Chief Meteorologist Jason Smith. The 2020 hurricane season will be unlike any other because of COVID-19. An already dangerous situation could turn deadly because of the virus. That's led to changes in hurricane preparations designed to keep you and your family safe. Over the next hour, we'll detail some of those changes and answer some of the questions you might have about dealing with a force of nature during a pandemic. It's actually worse than I thought, especially for a little storm like this. The action started early with Tropical Storm Cristobal, which fortunately passed through our area with no loss of life. But we must stay prepared for several months while also continuing to watch the coronavirus. Lenise Lagon and Byron Day joining me now. The COVID-19 pandemic is forcing governments to take a fresh look at how to keep people safe. That's right. The Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, rewriting the playbook for this year. Meteorologist Matt Barentine explains how this could affect what supplies you're going to need to have on hand. Tropical storms and hurricanes are a natural part of living on the Gulf Coast. In any given year, there's better than a 50% chance that we will be impacted by a tropical storm. There's also about a one in three chance that a hurricane will roll through. And there's a one in six chance that a major hurricane could devastate the northern Gulf Coast. Here's a look at the tracks of every one of those major storms. We are always a target. All that is just the average chances. But this year, the conditions point to the possibility of a season well above average. NOAA's forecast bears that out, and the season is already off to a hot start. So storms happen, regardless of whatever else is going on, including worldwide pandemics. We go through this every year. We all know what we need in our typical hurricane preparedness kit, things like bottled water, flashlights, extra batteries, prescription medicine, but this year, you're going to need to add some extra things to your kit. Things like face masks, hand sanitizer, and disinfecting wipes. COVID-19 makes this hurricane season like no other. It adds a whole other layer of complexity to getting prepared. If you are giving life-saving aid, if you are doing something that is emergency in nature, uh, and you can't maintain that distance, guess what? You got to do those things to save a life. Brian Hastings, the EMA director for the state of Alabama, has been working through the extra issues that COVID brings to an emergency situation. A delicate balance that throughout all the, uh, the functions that we're doing and the service that we're providing is that we have to always act as if we have COVID-19, and I think that's a great mindset, so that you minimize the threat to others and that you treat others in that way, and we all work together to emphasize, you know, let's do what we can to save lives and also minimize the transmission of COVID-19. Hastings said he's confident Alabama could deal with a disaster like this as long as we all pitch in and stay prepared. So at the same time that we're trying to isolate and physically distance, there's no greater uh, um, requirement for us to connect and be connected to each other to make sure that we help our neighbors out. It will definitely be a different kind of hurricane season, but being prepared for those differences will make it easier to weather. In Mobile, Matt Barentine, Fox 10 News. One of the biggest issues this hurricane season is what happens inside public shelters. The message is clear. In a potentially life-threatening situation, do what you have to do. I spoke with State Health Officer Dr. Scott Harris about this. If you need to go to a shelter because of a hurricane or, or tornado or any other reason, then you need to go to a shelter. I mean, that, that's the most important uh, immediate threat to your life, and that's what you need to do. But for people uh, who know that they have COVID-19, for example, they certainly want to take every uh, possible precaution uh, to, to stay away from other people. If, if there's a, a reasonable way to do that, if they're in a shelter, you know, let people know as they're coming to the shelter that they have concerns about transmission of disease. And really, you do the best you can. I mean, that, that, that's really a, a difficult choice to put people through, but, but clearly if you need to be in a shelter, uh, you need to be in a shelter regardless of your other diagnosis. 
One important reminder about shelters from the Centers for Disease Control. Make sure kids age two and older wear cloth face coverings. Face covers should not be used by children under the age of two. And it turns out shelter planning is something that emergency managers and school leaders have been working on for some time. Fox News reporter Hal Sherrick now explaining the plan to keep you safe. It's something we hope won't happen anytime soon, but along the Gulf Coast, we know all too well that we must be ready. It's only a matter of time before Baldwin County is hit by another major hurricane. When that happens, emergency management officials want you to be prepared. Knowing where to take shelter is critical for your safety. We want to remind you right now that if in the event uh, that you have to shelter. It, it's because it is your last option. It was the last resort and you need to do something now to save your life. That's especially important to remember this summer. The COVID-19 pandemic has forced emergency officials to be more cautious than ever regarding who and how many can come in. Emergency management officials say it's especially important to plan ahead this year for evacuations and other contingency plans. That's because with the COVID crisis, even the largest shelters like the Baldwin County Coliseum that would normally hold about a thousand people this year will only be able to take about a quarter of that. The same would apply to the smaller shelters. Anyone with a fever or showing other symptoms related to coronavirus will not be allowed in. Baldwin EMA wants you to be informed and prepared. It's released a video addressing what you need to know if you go to a hurricane shelter. It can be accessed on their new YouTube channel through Baldwin EMA's website. If you present symptoms while in the shelter, you'll be asked to go to the isolation care area. If you have minors with you, they will go to that area with you. While in the shelter, you will not be allowed to use common areas or group into large congregations. You will stay with your family and separated from all others. Now the three and a half minute video has all you need to know in the event you need to use a shelter this year. Emergency officials stress the importance of having your own evacuation plan by utilizing family and friends who live to the north. Even though COVID-19 is the foremost health concern right now, it's not the only one to worry about at public shelters. And not only coronavirus in a shelter is problematic. There are cases you can see during tropical weather events around the nation where shelters had uh, increased and, and were overcome with cases of flu. In the event storm shelters need to be used this year, Baldwin County school officials want to assure students and parents that each facility will be thoroughly cleaned and disinfected before the doors are opened back up. It's not just okay, would you just please mop the floor and take a Clorox wipe and wipe down some stuff. We're asking that they spend the extra time and if need be money to make sure that when we enter those buildings, our employees and our students feel safe that it's been recovered uh, in the proper manner. Reporting from Baldwin County, Hal Sherrick, Fox 10 News. The Mobile County Emergency Management Agency bases its decisions about hurricane shelter openings on factors including storm track and intensity. EMA says it will post a list of shelters in sufficient time to allow for timely evacuations. One shelter will also take pets. Now you're reminded to bring with you any medications you might need during your stay at a shelter. You know, thousands of people could be in shelters during and after a big storm. And Lenise, part of the responsibility for those people falls on the American Red Cross. Fox 10 News reporter Lee Peck found out how the agency is reworking its strategy. The American Red Cross on standby, ready to respond in a time of disaster. It's never easy, but add COVID-19 into the mix and they, like everyone else, are having to think outside the box. Their first big test during the pandemic, the tornadoes back in April. Uh, and that was a challenge. So, so what we did was we went from our traditional Red Cross shelters where there's a bunch of people in one big room uh, to non-congruent shelter, which means we put them in hotels. It was also good for the hotels because they, they needed the business. So that was a win-win. It was kind of a, an expensive proposition, but our thank, thanks, thanks to our donors, we were able to pull that off. 
Mike Brown, executive director of the South Alabama chapter, says they were able to house 300 people in 30 hotels. As they prepare for this storm season, they're ready to shelter thousands. During Hurricane Michael, they had supplies and space to take in 15,000 evacuees. Should they have to open the doors this go round, it won't look the same. We'll have the medical screening site for the volunteers that work the shelter, medical screening site for the, the clients that will stay in the shelter, make sure everybody's safe, social distance. So that'll be a challenge because we'll need probably three or four um, uh, times the space to, to shelter those folks to make sure they're safe. In addition to the Baldwin County Coliseum, they're looking to secure more schools and churches should they be needed and sending out a call for more volunteers. The needs for our organization when it hits um, are financial donations, um, in-kind donations of you know, water and the things we need in the shelters, volunteers and, and blood donors. When we really need the volunteers is before that happens so we can get them in, get them trained and uh, have them ready to go. With Crystal Ball now behind us and another five months to go, the Red Cross is prepared for what could be an active storm season filled with COVID challenges. In Mobile, Lee Peck, Fox 10 News. Fox 10 News is committed to always keeping you one step ahead of the storm. If you haven't already, download the Fox 10 News app. That way you can stay on top of all the breaking severe weather alerts this hurricane season. It's free for both Android and Apple devices, and you can get it on Roku, Apple TV, and Fire TV. Just scan the QR code. Okay, so we've talked about shelters for people who live here, but what about an influx of evacuees from other states? We're about to tell you about preparation for that on the state and local levels and you've seen some views of severe weather from our exclusive storm tracker trucks for years but this year there's an addition to the fleet what can it do that other vehicles can't later in the program out of because I can't go home. 26 year old Joseph Rashad evacuated from just outside New Orleans. He had to wait six days before hearing from members of his family who stayed behind. I heard their voice and it was just everything seemed perfect again. Back in 2005, many people fleeing Hurricane Katrina ended up in our area. But with COVID-19, the pandemic still top of mind, what's going to happen this year if evacuees need to shelter in South Alabama? I spoke with state and local emergency managers on everything from evacuation routes to handling evacuees along those routes. And they say it's all going to boil down to individual responsibility. Mark Blanda doesn't like to chance it. When it comes to hurricanes, he's been there, done that. Yeah, I've lived on the Gulf Coast, uh, including New Orleans, for half my life. He almost always evacuates when there's a storm. There was a storm in particular in the early 2000s uh, after I moved to Alabama, where we had to um, evacuate out to Vicksburg, uh, Mississippi, and we stayed over at the uh, hotel and casino up there and uh, came back and didn't really know what to expect. What can be expected? Dangerous flooding. Alabama's shoreline along the Gulf of Mexico stretching about 60 miles. With storm surges and relentless rain, low-lying area roads are often overwhelmed with water. Now add to that a pandemic. So this all got really challenging very quickly going into a hurricane season. And then when you reduce that capacity of those shelters, now you need maybe more shelters, which means it may have just gotten more expensive. And now you need to really think through what are those ones that we are going to use? How, how much lead time do we need to actually set up those things and think through that stuff? Even without a pandemic, mass evacuations can be logistical nightmares, clogging highways, causing traffic accidents, and depleting gas stations. And if you do decide to evacuate, evacuation signs like this one are going to be posted all along the routes. And we're talking highways 59 and 181 and the Baldwin Beach Express. Of which I'm told has been a game changer in terms of getting people out of the danger zones faster. 
and that information coming directly from the Baldwin County Emergency Management, which uses evacuation software called HurryVac. It's to help them determine the need for evacuations, how to execute them. So are they going to be making any decisions earlier than in the past because of the novel coronavirus concerns? Director Zach Hood says no. I don't see a relationship uh, in terms of coronavirus and uh, hurricanes in comparison to evacuation. Uh, what we do want everyone to understand is that it's very critical that you look at non-congregate sheltering and in order to get to the non-congregate sheltering option, uh, you would need to make every intent and every plan to evacuate and take advantage of getting out of the danger zone, if you will, in the event that we had to do so. So have a plan and supplies, something this pandemic has actually helped Blanda with. Actually, with the coronavirus, uh, we are actually more prepared uh, than we have been in past years. Um, we have already gotten a pretty nice stockpile of non-perishable food items. Um, of course, toilet paper, uh, paper towels, things like that. Uh, we've already stocked everything up with ice, plenty of cases of water, um, you know, batteries. I mean, everything that we, we thought we were going to need just because stores were going to be out. Um, and that definitely has us a lot more prepared than in past years for hurricane season. And I mean, I'm not sure about everyone else, but I'm very well prepared at this point. It's something we'll all need to be as individuals and families are being asked to do their part this year more than ever. The best we can do is just understand that um, Alabama has been through this before. Uh, we're re resilient uh, citizenry. And Hood tells me Baldwin County has seen tremendous growth, and that's both with residents and in tourism. The county is waiting on the results now of an evacuation study. It's going to factor in current infrastructure, census data, and routes, for example, to help emergency managers better gauge the clearance times going forward. Those results, they tell me, are expected in the next year and a half. The city of Mobile is preparing for a possible influx of evacuees. And Jason Fox. News morning anchor Eric Reynolds has that part of the story. I asked Public Safety Director James Barber if he was concerned when he heard this year's forecast, which calls for a high number of storms and hurricanes. I think it's concerning to everybody, but I think even a lot of us, as we talk, that we seem to be knowing that these come there's, you know, in cycles. And so, you know, with 2005, since Katrina, we've been 15 years very fortunate along the coast, even though we have seen some storms uh, but in our immediate area. But, you know, when storms have a different impact on us uh, in many, many different ways. So even if it hits the east or west of us, we have a large amount of traffic coming down I-10, and we already know the congestion that can happen around the tunnel system. And so we have to be prepared for those contingencies, evacuation of our own areas, as well as how to handle the pre-storm pre preparations. Uh, how do we handle during the storm is for trying to do our best to get people out of harm's way and then how to recover in a post-storm environment. Director Barber told me that Tropical Storm Cristobal was a good dry run for everyone in the city. And of course, we're all hoping that nothing more serious comes our way in 2020. Well, we depend on it each and every day. What's being done to make sure technology stays up and running during and after a hurricane? Next. Channel 10 stays on the air through the storm. We broadcast live all night, except for three minutes when the newsroom floods. I helped fill in that night from our transmitter in Baldwin County. Technology certainly has changed since 1979 when South Alabama was slammed by Hurricane Frederick. For the past few months, because of COVID-19, we've been relying on technology more than ever, with many of you working from home. You may be wondering what local companies are doing to keep information flowing during a hurricane. Fox 10 News reporter Morella Porter found out. When a tropical storm or hurricane strikes, it's never more important to stay connected. Whether it's a first responder, someone in danger, or families trying to reach loved ones, the cellular networks and internet companies we count on to stay connected know how dependent we are on them. 
people are relying on that critical connectivity and we want to ensure that we're giving them that connectivity when they need it most. Many of these networks prepare well before a storm is approaching, even year round to make sure they're equipped to provide connectivity in crisis situations. They've engineered the network with redundancies built in, so if we have damage to one part of the network, it'll keep running. When preparing for a hurricane, something as simple as putting sand down to protect their building from flooding makes a huge impact. We um, maintain all of our central offices and, and, and to do ch system checks because there's different equipment based on where you are. And then looking at the landscape as well, we have to make sure water cannot enter the, the building. We put sand down. There's all kinds of little things that we do that make a big difference. Most companies have engineers and technicians who monitor their network traffic and weather impacts from command centers. What we would do is work with our national team so they could take over quickly and, and support our customers and keep them connected. Rerouting traffic and sending out technology and support trailers, even using surveillance drones to help assess and respond to storm damage. We also set alarms, so we, if there's a customer issue, if there is a, a public official issue, that we uh, know about it before they even know about it. Commercial power loss is a major threat to these companies, which rely heavily on generators to back up cell sites and keep their network running for several days when power goes out. The vast majority of our cell sites have backup generators. So commercial power going out, you know, that's a that's a big issue with storms. So if the commercial power goes out, we have backup generators that can keep those cell sites running without that commercial power. Along with high capacity backup batteries, many companies have portable generators topped off and ready to go, making sure to save fuel, prearrange fuel deliveries, and even have tankers in place to quickly respond to hard hit areas and keep those generators running. Upon landfall, some companies will beef up their network in hurricane prone areas, boosting their network capacity to increase call volume. Mobile cell sites are also key to maintaining communication. If we have damage to our towers, we have a fleet of mobile assets that we can bring in. From cell on wings or drones capable of delivering wireless service from the sky to cell on wheels or on light trucks, which can be driven to impacted areas and help restore connectivity if lost. One of the newer things that we have is that fleet is a fleet of satellite assets. So these assets, should you have a loss of fiber, so fiber is a, a um, key piece of connectivity uh, to cell sites back to our main hubs. So if we have extensive fiber damage or damage to microwave, we can bring in these satellite assets and then we have dedicated satellite links to ensure that, we, again, we can provide that connectivity should we have damage to our infrastructure. In the past, some companies have offered Wi-Fi hotspots, charging stations, and other resources to entire communities, regardless of carriers, following a devastating storm. In Mobile, Morella Porter, Fox 10 News. When it comes to communication, you'll want to make sure your family has a plan to stay connected. When a storm is approaching, charge all of your devices and consider buying a portable charger. And make sure to back up any important information on your phone or computer. Hospitals also have to be prepared for any kind of emergency, but it could be more difficult this year during the pandemic. Maybe you have someone in the hospital right now and you're extremely concerned about what could happen. Fox News investigative reporter Brendan Kirby found out what's being done to keep patients and hospital workers safe. Preparing for a massive disaster is a challenge for hospital administrators during a normal hurricane season. And this is anything but a normal hurricane season. Hurricane season in 2020 means juggling a potential weather catastrophe with the ongoing health crisis known as the coronavirus. It has public health and emergency management officials thinking harder about how to accommodate a double strain on scarce hospital resources. But Randy Murphy of the Mobile County Health Department says she's confident the city's hospitals will be able to handle whatever comes their way. Anytime you have a disaster within the disaster, it just makes doing business that much harder. But as with all um, 
you know, disasters or natural events, man-made. Um, the hospitals are prepared and they exercise for these sorts of things. If a Category 5 hurricane were to blast through coastal Alabama, hospitals on both sides of Mobile Bay would have to brace for a potential surge in patients, but it's a good bet many of them would end up here. University Hospital in Mobile is the region's only level one trauma center, the only level one burn center, and the only comprehensive stroke center. That makes it a natural destination, both for people injured by a hurricane itself and the aftermath. Step one, hospital administrator Sam Dean says, involves making sure doctors, nurses, and other staff members are squared away at home and ready for extended stints treating patients. Keep in mind to have items that they need to be able to stay at the hospital for up to four days. You know, we prepare for the worst, hope for the best. And then they also, each staff member has to have a plan for their family to make sure they're taken care of so that they can be at work and here at the hospital and ready to be there for patients. Dean says the facility spends the early months of the year building its emergency hurricane kit. University Hospital has backup generators in case the power goes out for a substantial length of time. There's also an extra supply of medications, food, linens, and clothing. The worst case scenario, having to operate for seven days without resupply if the roads are impassable. And then we feel pretty confident that we'd have the ability to get additional supplies after that is needed. Then there's COVID-19. Dean says the rule in treating hurricane victims will be the same as with any new patient at University Hospital these days. Assume he or she has the disease. He says the hospital can add an additional 20 intensive care unit beds on short notice if necessary. If for whatever reason the coronavirus again comes back and begins to be more severe, we'll be ready for it. A hurricane has the potential not only to disrupt operations at the hospital, but testing for the novel coronavirus as well. Dean notes that USA Health's drive-by testing site recently moved from Lad People Stadium to the Mobile Civic Center, so at least it will be dry. For Fox 10 News in Mobile, this is Brendan Kirby. The threat of COVID-19 and now hurricanes can be very unsettling for young children. Fox 10 News anchor Sarah Wall has some tips on how to lower their stress. And a major challenge after a storm rolls through is keeping the supply lines open. We'll hear from the people on the front lines next. This hurricane season is a little different from others because in addition to tropical systems, we're also dealing with the coronavirus pandemic. And that can make a stressful time even more stressful, especially for our youngest family members. So what are some things that we can be doing to help our youngest family members understand what's going on and make this easier to handle? Joining me now is Dr. Christina Tallarico with Alta Point Health. Thank you so much for being here here, uh, Dr. Tallarico. Let's kind of start at the beginning and break this down. Why is this extra stressful this year, this time of year? Well, kids really thrive off of having structure and routine. And with the pandemic and also with school being out and the storm systems happening, there is really no sense of structure and routine for these kids any longer what they're used to with their typical day. So we're seeing a lot of kids also get nervous because they hear tidbits of the, of the news and they don't really understand what is happening. And sometimes the adults around them don't break it down and simplify it for them. So that could create a lot of anxiety and tension. And when we talk about hurricane season, that already can be scary for our littlest people because they don't necessarily understand how the storms work. And then you compound that with a health pandemic. Two things is a lot harder for children to deal with than just one, right? For sure. So what I recommend is for approaching both things with your family. So discussing the family plan for both events. So for the pandemic, explain how your family's going to social distance, how you're going to keep in touch with loved ones, how you're going to still socialize as a family and with friends that you do have contact with. And the same thing with hurricane and storm planning. You can discuss with your kid in simple terms that are appropriate for their age and development level about what the family's plan is, how you're going to stockpile food and water, where the safe zone in the home is going to be, where you're going to go if the storm gets too dangerous to stay in the home. So show that you have control over the situation and you made a plan for how to react to both events. Absolutely. And if we start, what are some things we should be looking for that may show us that they're not handling this well, that they are actually really stressed and really anxious about this stuff? Well, pay attention 
attention to your child. And definitely if you see some symptoms that become more noticeable, more consistent and more intense, those can be a sign of more lingering anxiety. In younger children, we can see more neediness, more clinginess. Um, and then as children get older and also with younger uh, kids, a lot of it is agitation, restlessness, um, irritability. So you might see kids having more temper tantrums, more outbursts, more refusal to do things they normally would have been able to do or would have been more um, consistent about doing. Also, you might notice them avoid certain things uh, that they used to enjoy or certain things they didn't give you trouble for. So also it can cause inattention and poor focus. So it can vary with children, but definitely irritability and agitation might be something that might not seem like anxiety, but truly is, especially in younger children. Absolutely. So, so what do we do if we start to see these things happening with our children? You mentioned talking to them. Is this a good time to go back through the different things that we're working on? Yes, and also try to validate their feelings and be an active listener. So go to your child and say, hey, you look worried about something. Are you worried? And help them identify their feelings and emotions towards things and also help identify what's causing those feelings. You know, we can just simply say, hey, there's a pandemic and there's storms coming. That's what the child's worried about. But sometimes it could be things that aren't so evident. So you really need to talk to your child and ask them what they're worrying about and how you can best help them. So local shelters have plans in place to help families, say, with young children or potentially families with special needs. The shelters can accommodate all those kinds of things. But as parents and as a family coming in, what should we be doing to prepare if we do need to go to a shelter to make it less scary for our kids? Of course, letting them take that one special object, whether it's a lovey or a special blanket or a special physic cube or something that'll keep them occupied and give them something to do, like a tablet, that's fine as well. But also discussing them what a shelter would be like, what kinds of people will be there and explain that it's volunteers and helpers run and that it might be scary at times, but that you're gonna be with them the entire time they're there. So reassurance is key and also explaining what to expect and also keeping something of comfort from home, whether it be a picture, a blanket, blanket or a lovey stuffed animal, something that they, they enjoy. Thank you, Dr. Tallarico. Some very important information during what could be a very scary time for our children. Now, if you have a family member with special needs or you have some special accommodations that you and your family may need, make sure you call ahead to the local shelter, to the emergency management uh, agency to make sure you find the shelter that can best accommodate and best help your family to make what could be a very scary situation a whole lot easier to handle. We are waiting in a line for gas that does not exist yet, but they, they have said they are getting gas today, so we're just waiting, waiting patiently, most of us. Lenise, we all remember the pain at the pump after Hurricane Katrina in 2005. And Jason, as you know, keeping gasoline, food, and other necessities moving across the nation is always difficult after a hurricane, and that could lead to shortages. We want to know what's being done to prevent that from happening again this year. Fox 10 News reporter Shelby Myers has the story. The first couple weeks were pretty stressful. Truck drivers on the front lines when it comes to keeping store shelves stocked. When COVID-19 first hit, they delivered groceries and toilet paper when those shelves went bare. A lot of phone calls and a lot of uh, trying to meet demands that you know a lot of people were having. Wright's company, Wright Transportation, has been pressing on since the demand for poultry and other agriculture essential products that he carries began to rise. Now his company is prepping for a potential natural disaster on top of a global pandemic. In any, any type of natural disaster, there becomes a high demand for certain products, so there, there would be a strain and it'd have to, uh, we, we'd have to shift our focus in different areas and put capacity in areas that we're not used to. A shift also in how grocery stores and large retailers like Academy Sports operate. We've got coolers, flashlights, batteries, water, canopies, tarps. It's a hot spot for hurricane preparedness. We're fully stocked and we're ready to go. But if a hurricane is on the horizon and hundreds of people rush to the store at once, serving those customers could likely look different. Here at Academy Sports, there are signs saying to remember to social distance and there's also still a limited capacity. If it 
becomes to a point to where there is any kind of concern, uh, we, w we can possibly limit the number of people inside the building while still providing everything for everyone. We rely heavily on the, on the men and women that, that support this industry, and uh, there's no doubt in my mind that they're going to step up to the plate and help us get through it and do whatever they need to do to, to make sure that freight gets delivered to, to the people that need it. And what about keeping supplies from running out once the hurricane hits? Luckily, it's not the first three weeks of the pandemic in, in a natural disaster because that, that would have created a big strain on the supply chain if both of them happened simultaneously. Bright says his team will begin running loads as soon as it's safe for them. And Christopher Mitchell at Academy Sports says since their company is based in Texas, it would only take a day or two after a hurricane hits to restock. A spokesperson for the Alabama State Port Authority tells me it will be business as usual for them, too. The port's workers are also essential in keeping goods flowing throughout our area and beyond. Shelby Myers, Fox 10 News. Of course, Jason, every storm is different, but there are some common themes. That's right. When it comes to a tropical system, any tropical system, which side of it you're on matters. Fox 10 News meteorologist Michael White explains. Well, when it comes to tracking hurricanes, we've all seen these cones, right? This is what's officially known as the cone of uncertainty, and I'm using Hurricane Irma from three years ago as an example. This line represents where the National Hurricane Center office in Miami believes that the center of the hurricane would be at any given point in time. But the cone represents where the center could go at any given point in time. So, for example, it could shift to here or it could shift to here. The Hurricane Center always gives them themselves a little room for error. The wider the cone, the more uncertainty in the forecast. The smaller the cone, the more certain the forecast. And if you're to the west of the center, you're on what's known as the good side. And during Irma, you may remember we had offshore flow. There was no water in the Mobile Bay for a time period because of the harsh north wind. So when it comes to a hurricane, the west side of the center is where you always want to be. We were in the same situation with Hurricane Michael back in 2018. Now last Last year we had Barry maneuver through the Gulf of Mexico and as a result we were to the east of the center when that happened and we were on the bad side. When you're on the bad side of any tropical storm or hurricane, you end up with onshore flow, heavy rain, storm surge, and tornadoes. Now each one of these risks, it simply depends on how strong the tropical system is and the closer you are to that center, the closer you are to the eye, the harsher the winds are going to be projected to be. Oh, we just got power flashes. We just got power flashes. Oh my gosh. They've been your eyes in the storm for several years. Now the exclusive Fox 10 Storm Tracker fleet has something new. We'll take a look inside next. During severe weather, you want as much information as you can get. And Fox 10 News has you covered. We're the only local station with technology to get you closer to the storm. We call it the Fox 10 Storm Tracker fleet. And our Lee Peck has been behind the controls many times during severe weather. He shows you now how it all works. When there's the threat of severe weather, we're on. Oh, and boom, there's one couplet there, and boom, here's the other one right there. Not only on TV, but on the roadways. Yes, it is starting to get lighter out here. As the Gulf Coast begins the 2020 storm season. Fox 10 News is ready. This tropical system bringing with it a lot of rain bands throughout the night. Tropical Storm Cristobal putting our storm tracker fleet to work. When within about a matter of 30 minutes, the water just started rushing over the walls again and making it even worse. I'm going to use our camera on our storm tracker truck to show you what we're looking at. From hurricanes to tornadoes. The past several years, these weather centers on wheels have allowed us to get you up close. Yeah, hey Jason, we're getting into the worst of it right now. We're heading back from uh, Mississippi, just now crossing over the state line. Let me show you here. Let me put the windshield wipers on here in the uh, storm tracker truck. It was back in October. If something's going to happen, it's going to happen within the next few minutes. Inside one of our storm trackers, we saw a twister coming straight for us on live TV. All right, we got to take shelter, I think. Oh my God, there's one right in front of us. There's one right in front of us. We're going to the gas station. We've since outfitted additional news cars with storm tracking technology. Making sure we're not only there to keep you safe for the main event. When it crashed through here, I said, oh God, help me. 
That's all I could do. Oh my God. You still seem shaken. I am. I am. But also there for the aftermath to share stories of survival. In Mobile, Lee Peck, Fox 10 News. And this year, the Storm Tracker fleet has been expanded. That's right, Lenise. A powerful addition to the lineup will help us go even farther. Fox 10 meteorologist Jennifer Lambers gives you an inside look. Here at Fox 10 News, we're committed to you. And with that, we're bringing a new addition to our Storm Tracker team, and that's going to be in the form of a new vehicle with our new Storm Tracker truck. Now, this is a new technology that we're bringing to the forefront of severe weather to help keep you informed. We always say that in severe weather, the best eyes are the eyes on the ground, and we're doing just that to keep you and your family safe. This is the control center. The control center allows us to view live programming, adjust our sound, and change camera angles while on the road. Also equipped is a 360 degree camera that gives us a comprehensive view of what's happening with the storm. The truck has four wheel drive, which allows us to go farther than ever before. We use this during tropical storm Cristobal as we drove down the west end of Dauphin Island. It gave us an exclusive look at the flooding and the damage that the storm left behind. This truck also has its own weather station on the roof. It gives our meteorologists live weather data, including wind speed, barometric pressure, and humidity, no matter where the vehicle is located. We can bring that information to you instantly. Make sure to keep an eye out for the brand new mobile storm tracker truck, the latest high-tech tool on the road. Meteorologist Jennifer Lambers, Fox 10 News. The National Hurricane Center has a huge responsibility, putting out information that can save lives. We'll speak with the center's director about the special challenges he and his team are facing this year when we return. National Hurricane Center in South Florida has an extremely important job, providing you with potentially life-saving information. And that job is even more difficult this year because of the coronavirus pandemic. I spoke with NHC Director Ken Graham about that and other issues in what is already a busy season. You know, the NOAA forecast was for a above average season, and there's so much that goes into it. You look at the heat content of the actual oceans themselves, not just the surface where we see most of the temperatures, but you got to look at the, you know, depth, get un under the water a little bit to see the, the heat content. And, and you also have a, a La Nina that's expected. So the upper level winds are going to be favorable for, um, you know, for more storms. And we even look all the way over to Africa, and you see an active monsoon season. Well, you add it all up. Everything seems to be coming together for an above average season. That's not a prediction for landfall, but we'll have a lot of storms here in the, in the Atlantic Basin. We're still getting the products and advisories from the National Hurricane Center just like we normally would. What's going on and how is the COVID-19 situation affecting the National Hurricane Center? Well, I can tell you like we uh, always are, we're going to be here for everybody. Our mission is so important to make sure we get this information out, the life-saving mission that we have. So we're going to be here for it. We're practicing social distancing, and we've got uh, signs on the floor. We've got uh, tape around the, uh, the areas of the workstation, separating workstations as well. So we're following the CDC guidelines. We're doing everything we can to keep ourselves safe. So we're here for you during the entire hurricane season. With that in mind, what do folks need to do to prepare for this tropical season? I mean, we've got the, the pandemic, we have the COVID-19 situation, shelters and evacuation may be a little different. Is it even more important than usual for folks to prepare early? Yeah, preparing early, we always talk about it, but even more now than ever, because you know you think about knowing that risk and, and preparations that you have to have earlier the better. You wanna avoid that rush know that risk. Are, are you right on the immediate coastline where you have to evacuate for, for a bigger storm uh, this season? Or if you're on those rivers, it's not just coastal, it's well inland where you can get that heavy rainfall. Know what your risk is and then you write a plan for that. So in addition to, uh, you know, what you normally have in your kit, you may have to put some, you know, some masks, some, some, you know, you start looking at hand sanitizer, some other things you may want to add to your kit. But earlier the better. You know, the earlier you do that, the less stress there is when they, and there's a hurricane threatening you. And the earlier you do it, avoiding that rush, I tell you, that in itself is, is such a big factor in lowering that stress. The latest edition of the Fox 10 News Hurricane Tracking Chart is here. Inside, you'll find important details about storms, evacuation routes, and COVID-19 shelter information. You can pick it up at your local Greer store. Fox 10 News is committed to always keeping you one step ahead of the storm. If you haven't already, download the Fox 10 News app. That way you can stay on top of all the breaking severe weather alerts this hurricane season. It's free for both 
Android and Apple devices. And you can get it on Roku, Apple TV, and Fire TV. Just scan the QR code. This promises to be a challenging hurricane season here along the Gulf Coast with extra pressure from the pandemic. While many things are unknown, one thing you can always count on is the Fox 10 Storm Tracker team. Meteorologist Michael White, Matt Barentine, Jennifer Lambers, and I will be here for you 24-7 during any threat. Thanks for watching.